Welcome back to the Leverage Podcast, where our goal is simple, to learn from the best and discover how we can all live a better life, build a more fruitful business, and be more productive. Join us each week as we interview fellow entrepreneurs, thought leaders, and leading experts to discuss everything from marketing secrets to new technology and life as an entrepreneur. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Leverage Podcast. I'm your host, Nick Sonnenberg. And today I want to welcome a very special guest and old and dear friend of mine, and that is Richard Rossi. He's probably one of the most fascinating people I know. And I've always looked up to Richard as an entrepreneur because I first heard about him through Genius Network, Joe Polish's group. And he's always been like this awe-inspiring figure. He's built some super successful companies over the years. He actually leads the number one mastermind group in the world on biohacking. And he just knows a lot about a ton of different aspects of how to successfully run a business. But as I've gotten to know Richard more, I've realized that beyond his success as an entrepreneur, He has an incredible story, and he's just an unbelievably fascinating person to talk to. He's one of those people where you could just talk for hours and and it would never get boring. Tons of lessons, tons of stories, tons of advice. And I think that you're going to find this episode a little different from most of our episodes in that we're not going to go too deep into tech or operations or how to grow a business. This is really just a casual conversation between two guys where we get to hear some amazing stories about his life, his lessons that he's learned along the way. And it's all very applicable to entrepreneurs, especially now while we're going through a change. But it's really just interesting to hear him speak. He's very eloquent and he's a great storyteller. Richard currently splits his time between running the National Leadership Academies, a company that holds massive stadium size events for high school students, and the Da Vinci 50 Mastermind, which is the number one mastermind in the world for biohacking, and specifically increasing longevity. In this episode, you'll hear from Richard about his time working in the US Senate, how he transitioned from that into becoming an entrepreneur, and then how he got into working with high school students and biohacking. And he also covers a few lessons that he uses for high school students, which are surprisingly relevant to life as an entrepreneur. So like I said, this is just a fascinating episode. I think you're gonna really enjoy listening to Richard and there's tons of little lessons to pick up throughout the conversation. Now today's episode is sponsored by, you guessed it, Leverage. What we wanted to let you know about is an upcoming virtual workshop that we're hosting on December 11th. It's called Bullseye, and it is all about helping you set your goals. And we're going to be showing you our planning system to help you achieve those goals in 2021. I'm really excited to put this workshop on because I think planning is something that a lot of entrepreneurs either don't do at all. They don't know where to start or they have some suboptimal system and they don't have a framework or systems or tools to actually capture, prioritize, and make sure that their plan is getting executed. And we've been working with, at this point, thousands of entrepreneurs. So we know what's going on under the hood and we know how needed a better planning system is. The system I'll be covering can work for any business and it's super efficient way to put your goals, break them down into projects, and then make sure your team has a plan and ultimately creates alignment. People in your team should know what to work on and in what order they should be working on them in order to achieve your business goals. So if you want to learn more about our upcoming workshop, just head over to getleverage.com slash bullseye and check out all the information there. It's going to be a six hour virtual session on December 11th, and you can get access for yourself and one guest when you purchase a ticket. We're also offering some other bonuses like a free consultation session with a system specialist, some planning templates you can implement in your business right now, and a few other special goodies. At the end of the day, If you're unclear on how to move your business forward, if you feel like you're not prioritizing the right projects, if you feel like you're just tired of having to micromanage your employees to make sure that they're focusing on the right projects, if you feel like there's a log jam happening right now, then this workshop will alleviate all those issues and give you some much needed clarity in your business. So again, be sure to check that out at getleverage.com slash bullseye. And let's get back into this episode to see what Richard Rossi has to say. Welcome back to the Leverage Podcast. Today's guest is a dear friend of mine, Richard Rossi. And I've known Richard for years now. We met through 
I guess it was Genius Network probably initially through Joe Polish. You know, honestly, when I first joined Genius Network, you were like one of those kind of like elite kind of people. In my mind, when I joined, I'm like, oh, wow, like Richard Rossi, this is an amazing serial entrepreneur, expert at marketing, just overall just knows how to do business. And I remember when I was joining, like really wanting to get to know you. And I'm, I'm really pleased to say that now I can call you a friend and now a collaborator through, through Leverage. But I'm really excited to have this conversation with you. You have a very interesting and unique background. You've been exposed to many different parts of business. I want you to share your story and lessons that might help people right now, especially during COVID. And also, so just to give a quick intro of, of Richard, serial entrepreneur, you, you studied political science in college, right? You worked for a senator for a number of years. You then got into the educational and live event space. You're now throwing these mega events. And like, there's a lot of people that throw events. I've thrown 50 person events and I, it's a pain in the ass to throw even a 50 person event. You're throwing though, beyond that, you're going into, what is it? 5,000 people plus or minus? Each event's just shy of 10. 10,000. And I, I want to talk about those events. They're for high school students. The, the, the name of that business is the, the National Leadership Academies, right? Correct. And I want to touch on what you're doing at these events. I'm curious also from a process standpoint, what's the process of throwing such a large event, how you've transitioned to virtual during COVID, and then also um, your, your latest project, the Da Vinci 50. And I know quite a few of the people in that, David Asprey, Jeff Gladden, would love to hear more about some of the, some of the things you guys are discussing in that group, because you literally have the world's top experts in health in that group. So I'm really interested to hear what you're hearing in that group as it relates to COVID and other things. So that's my long-winded intro. Thank you so much for joining us on the, uh, on the show today. Well, I'm delighted to be here. I also, fun, I also have fun talking to you and uh, I'm happy to go any direction that you'd like. All right, well, let's just start straight into childhood then. No. <laughs> 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 um, let's just talk about your background for a second and, and you know, were you passionate about political science and then something happened which caused you to be really interested in health? Like, what, what was your journey? Like, how did you go into politics and then from politics get into health? Well, look, it's like a lot of people who are watching today. You didn't really plan exactly where you ended up. And the route is never straight. It's a lot of times circuitous. And then nothing could have been more true in my case. I was just a kid who grew up in Greenwich, Connecticut, and my two parents were immigrants. And that meant that you were either, you had a choice of three professions. You could be a doctor, a you could be a lawyer, or you could be a loser. <laughs> and since I wasn't really good at math and science, it was decided that I was going to be a lawyer. So nothing I could have been less interested in, but I was just a little kid and I was going along for the ride and whatever, living my life. And then I went to college in Washington, D.C., and my parents moved on down there with me. And being rather controlling individuals, they said, you should go and get an internship on Capitol Hill and you should major in government. Well, government, for everyone watching and listening today, which is otherwise known as political science, unless you're planning to be a professor in that subject, nothing could be a worse decision. And that includes if you're planning to run for office, don't do it, don't do it. Uh, it's a lot of theory and, and not a lot of practice. But I did go up to uh, the Senate and I did volunteer for my senator from Connecticut and that turned into a nine year job in the United States Senate while I went to college on the eight year plan. I ended up having to pay my way through college and support my mom. And it was nothing short of 
incredibly fascinating in every single way. Is it a real job? Heck no. <laughs> There's no profit motive whatsoever. Uh, they hand you a check at the beginning of the year to cover all the salaries and all of the overhead, and they just say, go and be a great senator. So lo and behold, after those nine years, I learned a lot of lessons up there that we can talk about if you'd like, but I happened to meet a woman, a constituent, somebody from Connecticut who was a school teacher. And when I left the Senate, and this is an interesting point, Nick, a lot of people ask me, was it like this plan to go off and be an entrepreneur? And the answer is no, I didn't even know what that word meant. I just came up with this idea for creating computer systems for political campaigns. And I was judgment proof. There's nothing better than being judgment proof. You're in your mid 20s. You can't lose because there's nothing to take from you. So I just thought this is a good idea. And I found somebody that was willing to put a little money into it. And my best friend was willing to do all the programming. And I left the Senate and just started this thing. But believe me, there was no plan. There were no specific medium or long-term goals. I'm very jealous of young people now who have those because I never did. I just kind of went with the flow. It was a great idea that failed, failed miserably, in fact. But that didn't matter because I learned how to start, run, manage, and face enormous problems within a real business. That's how it started. And, and then there was a transition from there that got me to the world that I'm in right now. But those were, those were the early years of Richard Rossi up to about 25 or 26. I think that one of the things that resonates with me, we don't come from the silver spoon background. We're self-made people, also come from Jewish, Jewish uh, background. It wasn't doctor lawyer for me. It was, I was good at math. So they thought they pushed me for the accounting route that I quickly pushed back on and didn't go, didn't go forward. But I get that. It's interesting that you say you're jealous of younger people with goals or in so many words. I wonder what it's like now, though, to be a high school student, knowing that probably a lot of the jobs that currently exist won't be the jobs that they're going to be entering when they get into the job market, except, I mean, even a doctor could look totally different What by the time they become a doctor. I wonder what goal setting means or looks like when you're a high school kid right now versus pretty much the jobs that were around in high school were still the jobs that were around when I was out of college. It must be a completely different experience for these high school kids right now. Like even a doctor could be, could be that they just have to know how to move, like program the robot and make sure that the robot knows what to do. I mean, in 10, 15 years No. Well, it's very interesting that you mentioned that and it's completely accurate. So let's think about when I was a kid. And I would have said, mom, dad, what's my future going to look like? And they would have said, well, you know, things are changing really fast. They're improving, but it's kind of going to look like this within certain parameters. And they would have had good reason to say that. And what I tell parents of young people that are involved in my program is if your child asks you that question, the only honest answer is I have absolutely no idea. And that, Nick, is why the skill set that's so critical for young people, and which, by the way, is not being taught in school, is all about confidence and resilience and grit. And agility. And yeah. Agility and the ability to absorb and thrive on uncertainty and to in fact make that your friend because the message I give high achieving kids that I'm involved in is you're gonna have the most amazing future. It's going to be incredible, but I'm not quite sure what it's going to be. So you have to have the skills to thrive in any future. Uh, and those are, of course, as you and I both know, 
are not what's being taught in today's school system, which was designed for a world that frankly just doesn't exist anymore. It was not until college where I really was able to shine because I was really able to pick my path and the stuff I was interested in. But I just did not, I, I mean, I did well and I went to a good college, but getting taught in that kind of structured way where it's really just memorizing different pieces of content really just didn't jive with me. Is that one of the core things? Like, let's talk about the events that you're throwing. Is that one of the core messages that is being shared with high school students at your live events? Well, at my events, yeah. And let me just say as a preamble that after I left the senator's office, after I had a couple of businesses that lasted two or three years and then failed, through a story that's too long to tell, uh, this lady that I, was my constituent, who was a school teacher and I, uh, just one day came up with the idea of creating events, extracurricular events, enrichment events for high achieving high school students, live events. And we started with the inauguration of a president, and we then went on to civics leadership, a number of different subject matters, future careers, started with high school kids, then went to college, then junior high school, then fifth and sixth graders, then overseas. And in 23 years, we built it into what I call a big little business that was putting over 50,000 young people through live events throughout the world annually had a very healthy revenue and was doing great, and which we sold back in 2011. And that brings me to the model that I'm doing now, which is these live stadium events, which are kind of a cross. I like to call them a cross between a TED event and a Tony Robbins event and a rock concert. They're really just love-ins for the sciences and for medicine. And my focus has always been on the high achieving child because I feel that they have the largest leverage point for me. I can deliver a lot of value to them and I believe they will then deliver that value on to all those that they do lead. And my primary message to these young people, which would be the primary message that I would have for you, or for your watchers, uh, viewers, or listeners, is the number one issue in life, without question, at all times, is fear. It's fear of failure. It's fear of embarrassment. It's fear of all of those things that hold us back, that keep us from being confident, that keep us from taking chances, even prudent chances, that on our deathbeds make us look back and be filled with regret. And it's interesting, I have a, a good friend, Joan Rosenberg, who's written this wonderful book uh, called 90 Seconds to a New Life, I believe it is. And she gave me a twist on this that was so profound that when I heard it, it kind of took my breath away. And what she said is, it's not really fear because there's no tiger coming to eat you. That's real fear. It's fear of the discomfort. It's fear of the discomfort. Why do I not want to fire an incompetent employee? Am I afraid they're going to beat me up, put a bullet through my brain? No, I fear the discomfort I'm going to feel by taking that action. So that is my message to these young people. Your future depends on your ability not to eliminate fear, but to move through it to the other side. And if you can do that, you have an unlimited future. And I come at this 20 different ways, but it's always yeah. returning to that one message. Does that make sense? Totally makes sense. You know, I learned about the concept of unique ability through you know, these, these groups like Strategic Coach and Genius Network. Before that, 
I didn't use the term unique ability, but I always kind of thought of myself as my unique ability as being someone really strong at math and under having a good business sense and using that for my high frequency trading. And that was my unique ability. But like you, I learned a lot with my previous company that failed. And I also went through chaotic times with my current business, buying out a business partner and going through a roller coaster there too. And what I realized was actually what, what I feel my unique ability is, is pain tolerance. I feel like having a really high pain tolerance, which I guess is the brother to being able to push through fear is actually what I feel is my unique ability. Yeah, and, and it, it's a fantastic unique ability. And it's one that so few people have. Think for a minute of how many people you personally know, you, Nick, you, the audience, that are in one way or another held back by fear. And it is, it's prevalent, it's overwhelming. And then you have to go back and ask yourself, well, how did that even happen? How did I, as a child, develop a fear of that nature? I wasn't born with it. What? How did that happen exactly? Yeah. And it's a fascinating question. But obviously, what young people need is, yes, confidence, resilience, and the basic skills of success, listening skills, speaking skills, negotiating skills, the ability to feel enormous gratitude, measuring your, and all of that. And of course, the ability to pivot because the job you're being trained for, whatever that is, may simply not exist 10 years from now, but that's okay if you're thinking about it correctly and it's as not, a young person. And it's not just in business, right? Like think about that time in high school where you were too shy to go up to the girl that you thought was good looking and it's you had fear in that moment but logically if you were to go up to a to to, to play the odds and do it a hundred times nothing bad's going to happen if you get rejected but even if you only have a five percent conversion rate on it you're still better off going through the fear and net net you're going to be winning but people don't do it because they're scared I mean, isn't this the, it's such a simple fact that that, in our case, you know, woman is never going to take out a knife and sleep. Yeah, she's not going to stab you for asking her out. She's going to make you feel bad, right? And you don't want that. That's, that discomfort is going to be too painful for you to absorb. But all of us have some friend and he's probably not even that good looking who goes out to a bar and will take one no after another, after another, and after another with a smile on his face. And you know what happens by the end of the night? He's got somebody's phone number or better. And it's a lesson that transfers to everything. And the crazy thing is you see your friend doing that and you still don't follow suit and do it because <laughs> even though you've seen you've seen it be a successful strategy. And here's the interesting thing. There is a, a whole nother side to fear. And there's a wonderful book called The Gift of Fear by Gavin De Becker. And his point is that we were, because we're basically animals, right? And we live in the bodies of our ancestors. We have a sixth sense for real danger. And the weird thing is, that a lot of times we suppress that so that we won't seem prejudiced or that we won't seem in some way, you know, uh, to be a coward. And the example he gives is you're a female, you're going to a elevator at night in a building, the elevator door is open and there's someone in there alone, opposite sex, maybe a different race, and something feels wrong. But because you don't want to seem like you're a prejudiced person or anything of that nature, you walk into a steel box and the door closes. And his point is, if you don't feel right, you turn around and run. And that's real fear. 
That's not the fear we're talking about now. That's actually trusting your gut instinct about your own safety. And that's a great lesson too. Backing up for a second, the teacher that you were talking about that gave you this idea or influenced you moving into space, was that Lisa? No, no, no. This was a lady by the name of Barbara Harris. Lisa's my wife. This is um, a, a woman who is a constituent of mine. And she was 25 years older than me. She'd been a principal. She'd been a department chair. And she just had happened to have quite an entrepreneurial streak about her. And we just had this what the heck attitude. It's a, I mean, it's, the, it's, it's a great success story in that we ha- each had $2,500. We put it into one marketing campaign. If it hadn't worked, we would have just walked away from one another and gone looking for jobs. And that one thing that had to work actually worked. And that's what led to every success. (laughs) That leads to a very critical point that everyone should be thinking about, which is if you're a super successful person and you don't acknowledge an element of luck, just real pure luck in that success, you are lying. My old boss, when I was a trader, used to say to me, better to be lucky than smart. (laughs) Every day of the week. A hundred percent. Yeah. There is luck, but the way I look at that is you do the prep work and you put yourself into situations to maximize the probability of getting lucky. And over time, you're inevitably going to become lucky at certain moments is the way I think about it. Yeah. I mean, and I I get that. There is pure luck too. <laughs> but and and there are is pure luck in in the sense right place right time right and that it, it, they say that luck is uh, what is it uh, preparation and opportunity oh. meet. Well, and, I guess let's say you were to be sitting in the business class lounge about to take a flight and you randomly sit next to the no I don't know a Nobel Prize winner who's going to become the next keynote speaker at one of your large events or at Da Vinci 50. Is it lucky or was your previous success part of that story, which allowed you the opportunity to afford the business class lounge pass that put you in the situation to to have that opportunity? I get that. But there are things way beyond that. I'll give you a great example And that's Bill Gates and Microsoft. And I think if if you go back and you analyze his success, the pivotal moment was when he got the contract with IBM to produce the operating system for their PC. That's what actually gave Microsoft the opportunity to become the company it is today. But what a lot of people don't ask themselves is, At the time, Microsoft was a microscopically small company, and in come these executives with the most one of the most powerful companies in the world, and they interview Bill Gates and they go back and they pitch it. Why in the name of God would IBM have gone with a little tiny nothing company like that? And the answer is that John Opel, the chairman of IBM, when he said, who the hell is this person and why should I do business with them? The executive said, well, his name is Bill Gates. And he said, Bill Gates, Bill Gates, isn't that Mary Gates' son? Well, it turns out he served on the board of the United Way with Bill Gates' mother. And he said, you know, I love Mary Gates. His son's got to be a good guy. Let's do it. Had nothing to do with the fact he was, where was he at, Harvard or something before he dropped out? Or Yeah. And then he, well, another little known fact about Bill Gates is he was a millionaire before Microsoft came in. He made a fortune on the Fortran compilers. But be that as it may, that's luck. No, that's... And yeah, and then 
that that was the spark though and then from there he had the foresight to realize that the software was the real value valuable part of it not the hardware did you watch his documentary inside bill's brain yeah yeah i mean the guy is a genius absolutely he's another level he's totally at another level no one can outwork that guy and one of the biographies i read on uh, read about him they said no matter what room you're in he's the smartest guy in the room right so it's there's no question that he has extraordinary skills and extraordinary drive and yeah. he took that opportunity and made so much more of it than anyone else could have and by the way he he saw opportunities where others didn't when i worked in the united states senate Across the, the hall from me was something called the Government Operations Committee. And one day, a guy knocks on my door who I knew and said, I got this thing. Let me show it to you. This is back in the 70s. And so I walk in, and there's this computer sitting on his desk. This is way before the PC. And he goes, sit down, play with this thing a little bit. And I said, well, what's this thing? And he said, it's called a mouse. And I start moving the mouse around, and I see where in our office, everything is just lines of text. There's kind of this graphical interface, black and white, and I play around with it. Well, of course, Xerox Park had sent a sample of their computer to the Senate for us to see. And I played with it, and I stood up, and I turned to him, and I said, eh, and then I walked out. Do you think Bill Gates said, eh? Do you think that Steve Jobs said, eh? I mean, that built their whole future was they saw the GUI interface and then, well, they basically oh. stole it. <laughs> well, you don't have to see everything. You just have to see one thing in the right way. And you saw, you know, someone came to you about events or you were you know, the woman that you were talking about, and you saw an opportunity there and took that to a whole other level. Agreed. So it's okay that you didn't see the mouse one. <laughs> we all missed <laughs> things. I agree. I agree. Any interesting lessons that you learned while working for a senator in terms of that, that translated into how you view entrepreneurship? No, no, no interesting lessons in that regard. I'll just say very quickly that especially in this uh, very hyper uh, partisan atmosphere. There are people that say they're all a bunch of crooks and they, none of them really interested in their constituents. That's not true at all. The fact is the vast majority of senators and representatives are honest, hardworking people who are there for the right reasons. However, they are also very much a cross section of America, meaning some of them are really smart, some of them are pretty dumb, and a lot of them are kind of in the middle, right? So it's not like you've got a bunch of geniuses up there, but to say they're crooks, occasionally there's one, but I really did learn that most of them do the really the very best they can. But I didn't learn any lessons that refer. Like leadership lessons. Like I would imagine to be a senator. It's a complete, but that's a complete dictatorship. <laughs> I mean, that, that, that like the, these are people of enormous ego who simply rule by decree. This is like, it's like a plantation up there. <laughs> it's like that today. It's yes, Senator, no, Senator, whatever you say, Senator. That's how it operates up there. Nothing could be further from the truth when you're talking about a real business, mm -hmm. as I'm sure you know. I was just wondering if there was anything in terms of, yeah, lessons learned, leadership skills that you saw them have that maybe it's, maybe they're, maybe not, if you could strip apart the dictatorship but find elements of how they held themselves or how they did yeah. I guess the one thing I would say, and it's a huge lesson in, in, in business, you can delegate just about everything except for one thing, and that's leadership. You can never delegate leadership. And if you try to, if you take your eye off the ball, 
there's a very good chance your company is going to go down the tubes. So, you know, it's all about unique ability. It's all about focusing on the things that you love to do and you're great at, blah, 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 blah. But you can never delegate leadership. Agreed. And that's also true with every senator and every representative. I mean, have you seen them try to, to, to like, is there some example? Okay. Uh, no, on the Hill, gonna... <laughs> it's the opposite. It's Richard, the opposite. Go, go, go and figure that out. And just just run the whole thing and lead, lead, lead the team. Um, Never in a million years, and I'm not on the Hill. <laughs> but in companies, right? I mean, we both know people who say, oh, you know, I really just, well, you know, me and, the, me, me and my, uh, my wife, we just want to take, uh, six or eight months off and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. You know, if you're going to do that, you had better spend a lot of time preparing. Back to the fear conversation. Then I want to get into the health side of things because I, uh, <laughs> the Da Vinci 50, but I'm totally aligned and agree that being able to face your fear, break through it, you know, be agile is super important. And that message, you know, is really important to share with young people, especially high school students, when they're at such a pivotal age. But aside from sharing with them the concept, is there, to a certain degree, just is it within someone's DNA or genetics? And there's only so much that someone can have kind of a capacity for pain tolerance and fear. And at, at some point, it's just who they are and that you can't teach it? Or is it a teachable skill that anyone, no matter what their predisposition is, can break through? I believe the latter. I believe that, yeah, sure, there are people who are born with very little fear, the way we were just talking about it, and some with an enormous amount. But if they have the proper mentorship, and if they have someone to hold their hand and kind of ease them into it, yeah, can they make a ton of progress? There's no question about it. And why is that, Nick? Because it's all a matter of reframing. It's reframing that feeling in a different way so that it doesn't cause you pain, but rather is an indication of something you should be proud of. So I believe that it's very trainable, though most people are never trained in it. It would change your whole life if you were. Who are the types of speakers that you're having come to to these large events that you're throwing for the high school students? Well, and again, as I was saying, this is kind of a Ted meets Tony Robbins meets Lovin for science and medicine. So I put on that stage the biggest names in the world, Nobel laureates, deans of medical schools, great inventors, young geniuses, fascinating patients. We broadcast in a live surgery. What an incredible experience for a high school student to get exposed to something like that, you know, when they're 15, 16 years old. No doubt. And equally important, maybe even more important, is that they're around people who get them, right? Who think they're cool when most people think they're nerds and they're geeks. And that's what I tell them. You are nerds and geeks. And that's why you're going to rule the world. And, and also, like, I remember go, not, not um, medical conferences, but leader, like various leadership types of conferences in high school. But back then, there was no Facebook. I think cell phones were kind of just coming out. Now, you could be 15 or 16 from anywhere in the world. And I mean, now it's a virtual event, but still, you can stay connected so easily to... The, your peers that are also going to that event that unlike in the past, you actually can maintain a relationship with these people that you're, that you're networking with. Yeah. And that's one of the big lessons that I teach these kids. And it's about relationship capital, which to me is the most valuable capital on earth. Oh. The IRS can take away your house and you go bankrupt, but they can't take away your relationships. And if someone said to me, if you could go back to your 12 year old self and deliver one message, what would it be? And that would be the message. It would be 
relationships are worth more than money or diamonds or gold. You need to treat them like an asset. You need to record the name of everyone you meet, take a picture if possible, create a little database record on them, try and stay in touch when you can. And most of important, offer to be of assistance with anything they need with absolutely no quid pro quo. Will every one of those people become an asset to you? No. Does it matter? No. Because overall, you will have people who can help you with just about anything and will want to. So if you learn how to leverage relationship capital, and it's never too, too late, but if you start really early, that's the best, you are sitting on an asset of indescribable value. Agreed. I mean, in college, I was in the, the Jewish fraternity. All my best friends have come out of that. I've gotten business because of being a part of that group. And it's just so, so important. I mean, the money will come, but don't go into it with that intention. Go into it with the intent, in my mind, just to expand the way you think and your experiences. And to your point, the whole quid pro quo mentality is one that I see quite a lot that is just such a wrong strategy that people go down the wrong path with. Don't even bother trying to put together relationship capital if you're going to go down that route because you're just going to turn people off. <laughs> the other day I was talking to uh, someone we both know. He's one of the legendary copywriters in the world. And I was trying to get him on the phone or on Zoom for two months. I actually have an assistant whose only job is to bug people. And <laughs> she's so <bugging> finally, <laughs> yeah, we call her the nudge. <laughs> and um, finally, we set the call up and we're chit chatting. And then he's like, well, well you know, what's up? What, what can I do for you? And I'm like, nothing. I just wanted to check up on you. And there was like this long pause. And he's like, really? He said, that's so nice of you. And that was the only reason I wanted to get in touch with him. But yeah. he just I, assumed I wanted something. I do the same thing with him. I'll, I'll, I'll call him or text him. I have an idea for him, I, you know, or just to catch up and see how he's doing. I, I think it goes a long way, especially in a world where so much, so many people come at things from a transact. Maybe they're trying to mask it, but you can, it's very obvious when people have some transaction in mind with what they're trying to get as an outcome. And you can see, smart people can see through authenticity. Isn't that uh, true, Nick? I mean, it really, you can smell it, right? Yeah, totally. I mean, also take, take, take us, for example. We're on this call right now because you so generously and kindly invited me to a dinner about a year ago, which we already had known each other, but that really kind of was the ignition to further conversations from there. And I'm it's just so grateful that you included me in that because that's led to plenty of interesting conversations since then and a lot of things in the pipeline for us to to potentially collaborate on in the future. So well I'm I appreciate that. And let me just quickly give you the background on that. We and my we I mean Lisa and I, my wife, we've had good times and bad times. Last year was a good year. And we started thinking about what should we do with some of the play money. And I said, well, why don't we just go around the country and invite interesting people who we really like to have dinner together in small groups and we'll pick up the tab. We'll listen to some fascinating conversations. We'll renew some relationships and people will get to meet each other. And she's like, boy, that really sounds like fun. And we did that in five or six cities uh, in December, and I think November also. And there wasn't one of them that wasn't just a complete blast. Such a fantastic uh, idea. And at the end of the year, it's not a huge expense, but no. it enriched your life and the quality of your relationships dramatically. 
before ending this, I really want to talk about the Da Vinci 50. Would you mind explaining a, a bit how that's structured? All I know about it from, from our conversations is it's basically, it seems like one of the world's highest level mastermind groups for biohacking, longevity. You have literally some of the world's top biohackers, people in medicine. So I would love for you to share with me and the audience how that's structured, but then also in particular, what are people saying right now in, in regards to COVID? Are the members and the experts you have in the group, you know, are, are they saying anything that's different than what you're hearing on the news right now? It is the world's highest uh, level mastermind on those subjects. And I'll talk about that in a second. However, as you and I both know, the thing that usually distinguishes a mastermind is that the organizer is the guru. He or she is the authority figure and so on and so forth. The keeper of wisdom, if you will. That is not what this is. I am the host. I am someone who's great at putting on a really great show and making everyone feel warm and respected. And I'm also really good at connecting high achievers with genius and convincing genius to come into the room. In other words, the experts at this mastermind are the greatest experts in the world on top health and leading to increased longevity. So that's point one. Point two is I could not have had this group with a straight face 10 years ago, maybe even five years ago, because during that time, all that we really had to offer you was sleep, nutrition, stress control, exercise, none of which is going to significantly increase your lifespan. It may make sure that you live your natural lifespan, whatever your genetics say that is. It may keep you healthier longer, but is it actually going to add significant, healthy, vibrant years to when you otherwise would have passed away? No, it would absolutely not. However, all of that is changing and to some degree has changed over the last two or three years. Some amazing things have come out. Some are drugs, some are emerging modalities in that sort of exosome stem cell, but very sophisticated versions of that. And then there are stacks of things where you take one emerging thing and match it with another and another, and the three are so much more powerful than the one or the two or the third. But you're fooling with Mother Nature. You are going against the grain here. And that's why the decision I made, especially since I'm getting older, is I want to only be coached for the rest of my life by the greatest minds in the world on the subject. And I want to know about everything the second it becomes available and where it requires me being in a line. I want to be in the front of that line always. So with that in mind and realizing we'd have to pay a lot of these folks to come and spend time with us, I began organizing a mastermind of like-minded people, uh, awesome individuals who are also committed to the longest possible vibrant life and adding five years, adding 15 years, maybe even 20 years. And as exciting as what's going on right this second is what's coming in the next two, three, five years, much of which is frankly, like science fiction. And I'll refer everyone to one company, which you've probably CRISPR? never heard of. Yeah, is it CRISPR? Uh, no, it's a company called Sam U Med, Sam U Med in California, which in essence is using an entirely new methodology to repair and regrow organs and bone structure. And this is a very serious company 
They have things in stage three human clinical trials. Everything is FDA, going down the FDA path. But within two years, maybe three, just as this is one tiny example, Nick, you will be able to have an injection in your knee. And if you need a knee replacement, because your knees are, you know, like the bones are out of, everything's screwed up because you're getting older and everything's kind of uh, beginning to fade. It will regrow that knee to where it looks like the knee of a 25-year-old. Is that possible? Anyone would tell you it's not. Go look at the SAMUMED video. And again, I want to emphasize, this is passed through FDA stage one and two trials. It's in stage three, which is the last stage before FDA approval. It's jaw-dropping. And they can do that wow. with dementia. They can do yeah, that with looking. deadly diseases. It's one of only dozens and dozens of companies and technologies that are all coming online in the next few years. In my mastermind, we will have them first. We'll have the great minds advising as to the pros and cons. We will do everything that we can to not only extend that lifespan, but also make sure that we have vigor, mental acuity, and we're generally as awesome as we can be. I had dinner a couple years ago with the CEO of United Therapeutics, and they um, 3D print organs and grow them in pigs. I mean, it's just crazy. The world, it's really exciting to hear about these types of companies and try to imagine what life will be like in a few years. Not 10 years. Yeah. Just, just a few. What are they saying about coronavirus? Well, this is a very interesting subject. A couple of things. First of all, the general feeling is that we will have an effective vaccine in the next few months. And we just have to pause and remember that the typical vaccine takes six to 20 years to reach the public. And this is being compressed into months, not because any shortcuts are being taken, but because tens of thousands of the brightest minds in the world are all focused on the same thing. And one of the most exciting I've seen is uh, being led by Peter Diamandes of XPRIZE and Singularity, which is a mind-boggling vaccine about to enter human trials, which is the only one that's 100% synthetic. Um, so is, is, is good news coming down the road? Yes. How about what's ex uh, available now? The, the world of hydroxychloroquine has been so politicized that the truth, good or bad, is impossible to get. But what we believe and what the super experts in our group believe is that if you combine hydrochloroquine with zinc, with erythromycin, and do it all at the very earliest stages, never late, it can have an incredible effect on basically shutting down the virus before it ever proceeds anywhere. I, I wonder how that compares to this plasma treatment that, that you know, they're talking about. I wonder which one's more effective. Well, only time will tell. Plasma has a long history of effectiveness in many things over decades and decades. So I, I feel confident and our group feels confident that there is real hope there. The last thing I would say is this group has a huge emphasis on building the strongest possible immune system because that's really what's going to protect you. And when you ask yourself, why is a 20-year-old have almost no symptoms and a 60-year-old, a 65-year-old is in critical care, it's because of the difference in their immune systems, as well as some other issues. But it's basically that. So if we can keep our immune systems super strong, which, by the way, also helps prevent other problems like 
like a d decline of, of the, the organs and things of that nature, cancer, we will either not get the virus or we'll get a very mild version of it. So that's the basic feeling. I've got people in the group that won't wear a mask, that won't observe social distancing, that think it's complete crap. And these are not nut cases. These are MDs. Wow. Uh, and then others that, who feel differently. But what everyone can agree on is do everything in your power to build the strongest possible immune system you can. And are there some supplements or strategies that they've all kind of aligned on or agreed on in order to do that? Or is it different for every person? It's quite different for every person. So you really want to spend some time studying that. But I would say to every person that zinc supplementation, and there are two or three others, definitely vitamin C, definitely vitamin D, low vitamin D has been linked to much more severe COVID. Just those three things alone. When I was, um, when I was having lunch with Jeff Gladden, he said um, hydrogen, molecular hydrogen pills is, is kind of, I asked him, what's kind of one thing that everyone should take? And that was one of his suggestions. Yeah, you know what? He's a, he's, that's one of his things. And I take his, I take his brand of, of uh, hydrogen yeah. pills every day. But I do know, I do know in general, it, it's, it's a good thing with essentially no side effects. One last question on this topic, and I want to be respectful of time, but one thing I'm really curious is what's the consensus around when the vaccine comes out in the next couple months, hope, you know, please God, what percentage of the group is going to take the vaccine versus not take the vaccine? I would say that the, the, as a whole, and there are a couple of exceptions, uh, people that are not into vaccines, period, the group will take it. The big I'm gulf is when. Right. Is it, uh, they just don't want to be in the first round of it? They want to wait a month? Like what's uh, what the- Probably it? six to eight months. And the reason is- Six to eight months. So if it comes out in November, they're not going to be taking the vaccine until March, April, May timeframe? There are things that can come out down the road, like autoimmune reactions and so on, that simply, I mean- no doctor under normal circumstances would allow a patient to take a vaccine in the first year or two that it's released. They'd want to watch and see what happens with other people. These are not normal circumstances. And certainly the majority of the docs in our group say, if you're 75 and you have diabetes, I'm giving you that vaccine on day one because the risk reward scenario is totally on the take the vaccine side. So it, 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 there's no one answer to that. It's really going to depend. And then there's different companies producing this right now too, right? So is there even a question which, which type of vaccine or which company's vaccine to take? Is that also something to consider? Yeah, I, I, and I go back to Peter Diamandes and his um, company, Covix, they are doing this completely synthetic vaccine that on the surface looks extremely safe. Others do use uh, live versions of the virus that have been reduced in potency, which is how vaccines are traditionally made. So yeah, there, there can be decisions to be made within that. And certainly in our mastermind, we'll be having a lot of discussions uh, are there um, other popular vaccines that are synthetic that are currently no or is that no. is this like a really innovative approach to a vaccine that really hasn't been done before um it is incredibly innovative there have been synthetic vaccines for animals but not for humans um this is a peptide in essence that's another thing by the way nick both what Peter's doing and the the um, the vaccines that are based on I'm trying to remember what it is dRNA I think it's called are so novel and they're based on such fascinating science that they could lead to an entirely new 
world of vaccines against diseases that right now we have no defense against. So the sort of uh, byproducts could be massive here. And my, my, what, the only thing I would say to the audience is, please understand that when it comes to things like hydroxychloroquine, when it comes to things like the vaccine, they are massively hyper-politicized. Go talk to smart medical professionals. Don't believe what you read in the newspaper, either on the positive or the negative side, because it's all just slanted by the politics, which is disgusting. Uh, and I think it's immoral, but that's the way it is. We'll end on that. I've really enjoyed this conversation, Richard. I did too. Um, it was I'm, great. I'm so grateful for you joining us on the show today. We'll, we'll have to do this again sometime in the next in the coming months and continue the conversation. But before I let you go, uh, how can people find out more about what you're up to, about the events, about about the mastermind group? You know, in case they would, in case they'd like to learn more. Yep. Uh, well, as far as the work I do with the young people, you can go to future docs with an S future D O C S dot com. And as far as my work with Da Vinci 50, you can go to superaging dot com. This has been awesome. And we will speak again very, very, very soon. Well, I appreciate the opportunity, Nick. You're great. Uh, Leverage does amazing work. And uh, I, uh, I look forward to that. Looking forward to working with you through Leverage and everything to come. And hopefully one day we can do another dinner in person. Let's, I, I'm <laughs> sure we will. Take care. All right. Thanks. All right. Well, I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. Richard is seriously one of the most fascinating people that I know. And I just love any chance I get to sit down and talk with him because he has some amazing stories and just some very valuable insights. We're definitely going to need to get Richard back on the show at some point in the future. If you want to see what Richard is up to, you can check out his companies, the National Leadership Academies and the Da Vinci 50 in the show notes at getleverage.com slash podcast. And again, if you're looking to get set up for success in 2021, be sure to head to getleverage.com slash bullseye to check out the virtual planning event on December 11th. This is a great opportunity to plan out your goals for 2021 and get some much needed clarity in your business. And as always, if you liked today's episode, we would really appreciate it if you left us a rating and subscribed. Thank you very much for tuning in and we'll see you on the next episode.